Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. We are going to go ahead and get started with our webinar, Healthy School Environments Award Winners. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. We have a wonderful panel of speakers, so I am just going to go ahead and get started. My name is Alex Scheibel, and I am the Policy Analyst at Healthy Schools Campaign, which is one of the organizations that is hosting this webinar, and I'll be moderating today. Um, and first, just wanted to go through some brief logistics for the webinar. Um, the webinar is going to run about an hour, and we will post a recording of the webinar online along with all of the presenters' slides. And that link will go out in an email um, by the end, hopefully within the next few days. You'll receive that, um, and you'll be able to share that and download the slides using that link. Um, also, we have a very brief survey at the end of the webinar just for you to give a give you a chance to provide us with your feedback on the webinar. So we'd appreciate it if you could complete that. Um, also, our goal is to save 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for a question and answer session. So please feel free throughout the webinar. You have a box in the right-hand um, corner of your control plant panel where you can type in questions for our speakers. So please feel free to send in your questions throughout the webinar and we will collect them. And then at the end we will ask, um, ask our presenters to answer those questions. So we are going to um, go ahead and get started with our speakers. So today's speakers, we have Rosa Ramirez from Healthy Schools Campaign, LaJoy Mosby from the Office of Minority Health Resource Center, Sarah Ferenczi from Pacific High School, and Grennan Sims from Hickman Mills. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to our first presenter, Rosa Ramirez, who's the campaign manager at Healthy Schools Campaign, and she's going to provide you with a little more information about Healthy Schools Campaign and um, our involvement in our, the effort that we'll be speaking about today. Great. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm especially excited to be here with you all. We have an exciting lineup of speakers, as Alex just mentioned. But first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Healthy Schools Campaign. We're a nonprofit organization that works at the local, state, and national levels, and we really believe in a simple, common sense notion that healthy students are better learners, and that health and wellness should be incorporated into every aspect of the school experience. So we know, and, and I know many of you online with us today know that schools can and do play a powerful role in shaping our students' lifelong habits and behaviors. We have a long history of engagement with Chicago Public Schools at both the district level and, of course, the community level. Uh, we have advocated for a range of policies, ranging from returning recess back into the school day, implementing breakfast in the classroom, and a number of other exciting and progressive programs. Uh, for a number of reasons, our work has mainly focused at the grammar school level, uh, although we do have a healthy cooking high school culinary, culinary competition, which we're actually going to be entering, um, we're going to be kicking off our national context um, next week. Um, so if you're interested, we would send you some information about that. And if you're in the DC area, we hope you can join us. Um, but we really just believe our experience in community building, the professional development we do with teachers, principals, uh, parents, um, really helps leverage and inform all of the policies and programs that we advocate for at the state and the federal level um, to create healthier school environments. Um, you know, as you know, more and more research shows the, the important connection between health and learning, and we know that, um, that the health disparities are also linked to the achievement gap as, um, prevalent in our minority students and low-income students. And an important strategy for addressing the achievement gap is to address the health disparities themselves. Otherwise, it's an uphill bat battle to close both. Um, and for that reason, we're a very proud uh, member and co-chair of the Action Learning Collaborative, which was convened in April of 2011 by the Office of Minority Health. Um, you know, LaJoy will tell you a little bit more about the purpose of that group. Um, but today, we're very excited that we can tell you a little bit about our work, and then you'll hear a little bit about the other speakers. Next slide. Um, so just a little bit about what we were able to do in Chicago. 
Um, three years ago, Chicago Public Schools, with our help, um, was able to transform their school food program. Um, they've implemented nutrition standards that resulted into a lot more whole grains, different fruits and vegetables every day, um, real changes, and, they, and the district and the community knew that you couldn't just make healthy changes without doing an educational initiative with students and their families so they can uh, assess those healthy changes. So we launched an initiative um, to get schools to com complete the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. And I think we'll do a little poll in a little bit of, about uh, how many of you are familiar with the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. And around the same time, the First Lady uh, launched her, her initiative, Let's Move, and obviously with the goal of reversing the trend of childhood obesity within a generation. And a key component of her initiative was the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. And it's a recognition program to encourage school districts to adopt high standards for school food, integrate nutrition ed into the classroom, and get students moving throughout the school day. Uh, so we thought, what a great way to harness this national conversation that the First Lady is spearheading and really you know, motivate our city to, to make health a priority during the school day. So we set the goal to get 100 schools uh, to be recognized by June 30th of 2013, which is at the end of this month. And we're happy and very proud to report that we have 117 schools that have met the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. And on your screen, you see a map of Chicago, and the gold dots are where all the schools are located that have met this national recognition program. Um, I also included some information of, of the other things that we were able to accomplish, you know, and impacted in our community. We spearheaded uh, a variety of professional development programs for both our teachers and our principals to really help them understand the evidence base between why healthy students are better learners. I think many of us intrinsically know it, but once you really look at the data and really recognize the results, um, many were uh, very open to uh, including physical activity breaks during the school day to uh, paying more attention of how food interacts with their students and things like that. Um, Chicago Public Schools also hired a chief health officer, which is very notable uh, for a district this size, and they established an office of student health and wellness that is responsible for um, spearheading um, these initiatives. And also, uh, just one last thing I wanted to mention was um, on the school progress report cards that all schools receive, um, letting them know how they do well in math compared to other schools, compared to uh, uh, in the state or nationally, there's also a, a now a healthy school indicator on the school progress report card um, that has really motivated principals and the school community to really look at health as part of the school day. Um, but I'd be happy to tell you more about it, and you can, of course, um, check out our website to hear more about this story. You know, and again, just getting back to the heart of our work, what we really accomplished is, you know, changing the daily environment for our children that are currently in school. And here's a photo of, of one school um, you know, celebrating that they were a go for the gold school, which is the the, the name that we branded here, the initiative to get 100 schools to be part of the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. You know, so it's for the kids, and we should always keep that front and center. Great. Thank you so much, Rosa. Um, I really appreciate you providing that background. And what next, we're going to hear from LaJoy Mosey, who's going to be speaking about um, the Office of Minority Health Research Center and the Action Learning Collaborative, which, as Rosa said, um, is the project that Healthy Schools Campaign was part of. And later we'll be hearing from two of the grantees that received support from the Action Learning Collaborative to support the Healthier U.S. School Challenge in their schools. Um, so before I introduce uh, LaJoy, I just wanted to ask the audience to do a quick poll for us. Um, just to hear if you all have heard of the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. Rosa just spoke about it, so now <laughs> you probably have. Um, but we would love to hear from you all as I introduce LaJoy. So LaJoy is the Deputy Director of the Office of Minority Health Research Center, which is the nation's largest repository of information on racial and ethnic minority health issues. 
And LaJoy's career includes experience in both public and private sectors. And before coming to the Office of Minority Health Research Center, she was the dual program manager for the American Association for the Advancement of Science, heading their Black Church Project and the Black Church Health Connection Project. So as we finish um, taking those polls, I will share the response. So it looks like um, about 70% of you have heard of the Healthier U.S. School Challenge, and we would be happy to include additional information about it um, in the email that goes out after the webinar. So we will be sure to do that. Um, so without further ado, um, I am going to pass it over to LaJoy from the Office of Minority Health. LaJoy? Yes, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by providing you with a brief overview of the Office of Minority Health Resource Center, and then I'll discuss the development of the Action Learning Collaborative. Next slide. You may ask, what is the Office of Minority Health Resource Center, or as we refer to ourselves, OMHRC? Well, the Office of, I'm sorry, Office of Minority Health Resource Center was established by the U.S. Office of Minority Health in 1987. And the U.S. Office of Minority Health is an agency within HHS. The, it was created in 1986, and it is considered one of the most significant outcomes of the 1985 Secretary Task Force Report on Black and Minority Health. You may hear this report referred to as the Heckler Report after then um, HHS Secretary Margaret Heckler. The agency itself is dedicated to improving the health of racial and ethnic minority populations through the development of health policies and programs that will help eliminate health disparities. And the agency is regularly uh, reauthorized to continue to exist, uh, and it was reauthorized by the Affordable Care Act, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act 2010. Next slide. You've already heard that we are the nation's largest repository of information on, on uh, any health issues relating to racial and ethnic minorities and the underserved within the United States and its territory. Essentially, we are a one-shop stop. Uh, what did I say? One-shop stop. One-stop shop for, the, for information on minority health and related topics. Next slide. The Resource Center provides a host of free services to health professionals, nonprofits, and community-based organizations as well as consumers. On the slide, you can see what on the left, you can see our teams, our resources on the right, the, the products that we provide. Next slide, please. Our services include a toll-free number, uh, which you'll see later, that is available Monday through Friday, 5 I'm sorry, 9 to 5 Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Time or Eastern Time, whatever works for you, with live and well-versed information specialists. Uh, we have two uh, young ladies here who are bilingual Spanish to provide you with customized uh, responses uh, on information such as minority health topics, programs and organizations. We do literature searches. We can provide you with statistics. We do funding searches for federal and non-federal sources of organizational funding as well. And we can also refer people to health services and other agencies that can assist them. Next slide. We also have a, a knowledge center here with an online database of nearly 50,000 articles, reports, as well as organizations that have a focus on minority health. Next slide. A unique aspect of the Resource Center is our capacity building team, which provides technical assistance and training to the nonprofit community and faith-based organizations and health departments around the United States. Our niche in terms of how we got started doing technical assistance was that we were working to reduce the incidence of HIV AIDS in minority populations, and we still work with agencies that are, that have that focus in an effort to increase their capacity to do their work better. Next slide. And we can offer you weekly and monthly e-newsletters that can provide you with a wealth of information on grants, 
new publications, tools, and other resources that might be useful to you. You can sign up for our newsletter on the OMH website, which is uh, minorityhealth.hhs.gov. You'll see that later. Next slide. And this is our, our website. Again, that's minorityhealth.hhs.gov. Next slide. Best of all, it's free. Uh, you can call us at 1-800-444-6472. You can email us, and you can visit us on the web. Next slide. In an effort to raise awareness about various health issues, we implement health campaigns, such as A Healthy Baby Begins With You, and we collaborate with the Office of Minority Health to develop and implement the annual National Minority Health Month Observer. The Action Learning Collaborative came about as a result of our development of the theme and related activities for the 2011 observance of the National Minority Health Month. That year, the Office of Minority Health and the, and the Resource Center devoted minor, National Minority Health Month to the issue of healthy school food. Heroes for Healthy Schools Week was a successful series of events implemented in Chicago during that month. That was a result of a partnership between the Healthy Schools Campaign, Chicago Public Schools, the Office of Minority Health Resource Center. And in that context, the Action Learning Collaborative was launched. I want to really thank the Healthy Schools Campaign for all the work that they did. Uh, they were incredibly instrumental in the successful execution of the activities that occurred in Chicago and beyond in regards to this effort. Now, you may ask, what is an Action Learning Collaborative? Well, when we talk about an action learning collaborative, we are referring to bringing together interdisciplinary teams to work to improve a process, a practice, or a system. And of course, that's, as I call it, the official definition. And all the team members would learn and teach from their collective experience and challenges. The, the, the general concept of ALCs is that they have successfully operated to improve outcomes in a broad range of settings and have measurably, measurably improved the health of targeted population. In partnership with the Healthy Schools Campaign, we convened a cadre of 22 invited national and local leaders who had been working on nutrition, childhood obesity, school health, school food, school environment, and related issues to become part of our ALC advisory group. The initial meeting of the advisory group got off to a great start with a citywide forum on health disparities in edu edu and, excuse me, and education with more than 400 attendees who heard from experts from including the local public school officials about the latest research on the impact of health disparities on student achievement. That forum set the tone for the Action Learning Collaborative Advisory Group meeting because it highlighted essential points uh, such as there are linkages between health disparities and achievement disparities, and that effective partnerships and coordinated efforts among schools, the private sector, health department, and government agencies can result in an effective response to the two-pronged crisis of health and achievement, in particular amongst minority children. The advisory group meeting allowed the participants to share their experiences and develop support and implementing programs and activities that focused on school food, school environments, and community outreach around nutrition and achievement. A representative from the regional office of USDA also provided additional insight on the USDA Healthy U.S. School Challenge. To next slide. To continue the synergy created by our ALC activities during Minority Health Month, with input from the advisory group, we competitively awarded $5,000 each to five public schools across the U.S. to support their efforts to meet the standards developed by the USDA Healthiest School Challenge. These schools had to meet the criteria, which was developed in conjunction with the ALC, which included that, which required that schools participate in the National School Lunch Program and have a low-income student population, that if, you, if the school system was working or the school was working with a nonprofit, 
that they could also apply for the the award uh, as long as it was understood they were working in conjunction with the school or the school system. The applicants were required to be official USDA team nutrition schools and that we were really looking for schools that, that were going to engage youth and community and also were looking to develop a sustainability plan beyond the period of time that we were providing funds. And of course, there was an implementation period from 2011 to 2012. And as well, advisory group members were also available to provide advice and guidance as needed to the awardees. Next slide. Okay. The awardees were uh, the, starting off with the Ingalls Elementary School in Kansas City, Missouri, which created a program called Color My Tray, and that incorporated the USDA Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program into their activities. Uh, Agula Elementary School in Tempe, Arizona, which implemented activities that included a focus on nutrition and physical activity, along with incorporating the Healthy U.S. School Challenge components and standard into their school wellness policy. Pacifica High School at Sitka, Alaska, which developed a fresh school lunch program. And I'll let the, the speaker elaborate more on their activities. Uh, Beatrice Rafferty School and Perry, Maine, which uh, had a goal of increasing physical activity and changing the perception of students in terms of their mindset around physical activity. And Bernie Dover Jackson School in New London, Connecticut, whose goal was to really foster a state safe and health school environment with an emphasis on improved student behavior. Next slide. As you can see, the awardee program focus was on was on school food and nutrition, physical activity, and healthy choices and decision making. Overall, you can turn down all of the the different activities into these three categories. Next slide. So I'd like to say thank you again. Let me say thank you to the Healthy Schools campaign because uh, we could not have done this without them, and we are grateful to all of the members of our. Action Learning Collaborative Advisory uh, Group and their commit continued efforts to educate communities on the role of good nutrition, healthy school environment, and school achievement. And last, but certainly not least, I would like to thank our school awardees for their efforts to improve their own schools. We certainly hope that the modest awards allowed them uh, to move forward in their quest to be healthier schools and to be uh, to provide a, 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 a way of educating their community around this issue. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, LaJoy. Um, and I know on behalf of the Healthy Schools Campaign, we really um, appreciate the leadership of the Office of Minority Health Research Center on, with the collaborative. Um, and we are excited today to be able to hear from two of those grantees that LaJoy spoke about. And so before we hear from the first grantee, I wanted to ask the audience one other quick poll question. Um, we want to get an idea of who is out in the audience. So tell us if you are a parent, if you're a member of school staff, it could be teacher, principal, school nurse, uh, a nonprofit advocate, if you're representing a government agency today, or fall into that other category. And while everybody is responding to the poll, I'll introduce our next speaker. Sarah Ferency, who is co-principal of Pacific High School, which is a small alternative high school located in Sitka, Alaska. Certified in biology and chemistry, Sarah has taught almost every subject at Pacific High School over the past 15 years, including health and home economics. Since becoming co-principal in 2010, Sarah has dedicated significant effort to revamping the school's lunch program with an eye towards sustainability and replicability. As a mother of two, she knows children will eat their vegetables if they are involved in bringing them to the table, from the garden, through the kitchen, to the plate. So we are very excited to have Sarah with us today. Um, and I will close the poll now and share, just so everybody has an idea of who's out there. Um, it looks like we have a nice mix of people, no parents, but um, a lot of people representing schools today nonprofits, a few government representatives, and then other. Okay, 
So great. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started with Sarah's presentation. Sarah? All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so our program is called Healthy Lunch, Healthy Lives. Um, and you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so I just want to start by giving you a little bit of context about us and where we are and things like that. Um, so here's a map of the United States and of Alaska with Sitka identified. Um, we are located on Baranoff Island, which is in the outside waters of the inside passage of Southeast Alaska. If you've ever been on a cruise to Alaska, you may have come to Sitka. Um, it's accessible only by plane or boat, since we're on an island. Um, and we have about 9,000 people in town, um, and the road is 15 miles from end to end. And there's a sign at each end that says end, and that's as far as you can drive. <laughs> about 30% of the population here in Sitka is Alaska Native. Um, and our economy is highly dependent on natural resources, education, health care, and tourism. Um, we're in the heart of the Nat Tongass National Forest. Um, we have uh, significant um, historical and cultural resources, uh, Department of Fish and Game, and there's also a, um, a strong commercial fishing fleet here in Sitka. Uh, we have three high schools and a local college um, and a regional Indian Health Services Hospital. So those are what drives that. And then finally, of course, um, tourism and the visitor industry between cruise ships, independent travelers, and charter fishing. Um, that's a fairly significant economic driver. Next slide. So this next slide is where I would normally put a picture of our school. Um, and in fact, there are some pictures of our school here. Uh, it's interesting, as I, as I did this, put together this presentation, I realized how much our school facility has been an underlying theme of the presentation. Um, so we are in the process right now. We're in a temporary location, and we're in the process right now of having a brand new school built. So you see our old school, our old school being torn down, and the architectural drawings of the new school, which is very exciting. So we're a small alternative high school serving grades 9 through 12, um, students ages 14 to 21 typically. We have about 30 to 40 students at any given time, although we have high transiency rates, so we usually see at least 50 each year. Um, serving those students, we have three teachers. Um, one full-time equivalent principal, basically two people doing a half-time job each, and then a half-time secretary. 89% of our population is eligible for free and reduced lunch, and while our town is about 30% Alaska Native, our school is over 70% Alaska Native. And about 50% of our students um, fit the federal definition for homelessness, which doesn't necessarily mean they're sitting on the streets, but it may mean they're doubled up or in inadequate housing or other things. We also have um, always a few students who are pregnant and parenting. One thing that sets us apart from most alternative schools in Alaska, though, is that we not only serve at-risk students, which we do do, but we also have um, a true alternative educational philosophy. Um, and so our education that we provide is experiential, um, authentic, it's community-based and place-based um, with a strong um, service learning component as well. So while our students um, do experience multiple risk factors, we also um, provide a different kind of education. Um, and you can go ahead to the next slide. So just to give you a big picture overview of our program, basically the big idea is that between two and four students prepare school lunch um, for the entire student body. Everything is made from scratch just about. Um, and they are supervised um, by an AmeriCorps volunteer. In addition, we offer cooking, nutrition, and gardening classes that we're trying to um, complement sort of the, the program, just the lunch program itself. Um, next slide. So to give a little history, um, Pacific High School has always been sort of a redheaded stepchild. We started out as a contract program through the university. It was just tutoring at first about 21 years ago. And we've always been sort of in a borrowed building or someone else's cast off building. Um, and as a result, we've never had any kitchen facilities um, or any adequate kitchen facilities. And so um, the district contracts with the contractor to provide school lunches. And we've always been sort of an afterthought added on to that. In the early years, it was pretty good because we were on the campus of a, of a local boarding school um, that's uh, but then after that, the contract changed, and we started getting um, lunches, bag lunches from the local Pioneers home, which is a um, you know retirement home or whatever. Um, and they would be typically, in fact, for a while, for a year or two, every day, it was a lunch meat sandwich with one slice of bologna, one slice of American cheese, 
mayonnaise on rye, and I don't know if you guys, if this is true for you all, but none of my students like rye bread, and it was always rye bread, um, an apple or jello, chips and milk. Um, and then we moved to a different building, and we're then receiving sack lunches from the um, primary school, um, ages, you know, five and six, and so the lunches were pretty small, even when they gave us double lunch, it would be an uncrustable packaged peanut butter and jelly sandwich that inevitably was burned. Again, lots of jello and milk. This picture isn't actually a picture of one of our lunches, but I felt like it represented it really well. Um, I don't think we ever had french fries because we never really had any food that was that hot. Um, and then another example, the sort of turning point was the desiccated spaghetti shrink wrapped in a boat and then the box of SpongeBob um, really sweet milk. So the lunches were lacking in both quantity and in quality, and although um, about 90% of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, basically, about three students would sign up to get a lunch each day, and most of the food really went uneaten. So our students were not eating. The other thing that we found um, is that when the food changed from being um, quality food that was provided by the boarding school to these sack lunches, we, we really had a, a loss of community um, because students were no longer staying in school. We have an open campus. They were no longer staying in school to eat their lunches. Um, they would leave and either go to the convenience store or go home or go to their aunties or something to try to find some food that was worth eating. Um, and so we would have nobody in the building from when class went out till when class started. And we really lost a lot by losing that informal time that we spend with students. Um, so this was about now, at this point, like eight years ago, the principal at the time, Kathy, Kathy Blizzard, she took that desiccated spaghetti up to the superintendent and put it on his desk and said, this is what you are feeding the hungriest children in your district. And so he agreed to allow her to start um, a home-cooked lunch program. Um, we had seen a similar program at an expeditionary learning school in Dubuque, Iowa where it was um, a larger, a much larger school, um, and it was basically the vocational program for the school was a culinary arts program. And so instead of hiring um, a, a cook to cook school lunch, they hired a cook slash teacher to um, train students to cook school lunches. So based on that model on a much smaller scale, um, we started making our own lunches. So you can go to the next slide. Um, over the past eight years, this um, lunch program has taken on really a variety of incarnations, and for much of that time, it has been a very ad hoc program. Um, that's a picture of our old school, the kitchen. You can see that it's really just a home kitchen. Um, and while that's a big fridge for a family of four, it's a small fridge for a family of 30. <laughs> and um, it was really just a glorified home kitchen. There were three things to make it commercially um, licensed, but that's really it. Uh, for a while, each teacher would take a term. Um, we would teach themed lunch classes, but we would have a class of 12 to 15 students, which obviously is not going to fit in that class. So we were sort of running back and forth down the halls from our classroom to the lunch, trying to get lunch cooked, and then also trying to teach an academic class at the same time. Um, but we did some really interesting and exciting stuff. I remember one class that uh, that guy and the teacher, that teacher in the picture did, um, called Rich Lunch, Poor Lunch. And so it was actually a global issues class, and they studied what people eat throughout the world and did four days of poor lunch, things, things that people in poor country, countries eat, you know, rice and lentils and things, and then, and then the rich lunch was on Friday, and that would be, you know, more American-style lunch or whatever. Um, there was a lot of student input and ownership of the menus, um, and there was a, it required a lot, a lot, a lot of our former principal's time. And um, in terms of compliance with uh, nutrition regulations, um, I think the, the foods we were serving were absolutely nutritious. They were probably also pretty high in salt and fat, um, relatively speaking, and the documentation just um, wasn't there. In fact, I always kind of say that it's a miracle that they let us keep going. But they did, and I'm very glad. Um, at some point along the way, we got an AmeriCorps volunteer also to help us with this program. Uh, next slide, please. So to give you an idea of our current program, um, we now have, starting as of this year, we have a brand new commercial kitchen in the Career Center, which is next door to the building you saw. It's actually also where we are temporarily located at the moment. Um, and that's where the grant money came into this. So um, we bought for that a large six-burner commercial stove that you can see in this picture, and also a 
a nice big double fridge. And so now um, we can serve fresh fruits and vegetables and only shop once a week. Before we had to shop at least twice a week if we were serving all fresh food. Um, and so that's really exciting. Um, it's incredible. And the, the, um, the level of professionalism, I think, has really stepped everything up because kids take it much more seriously because it looks like a commercial kitchen and because it is a commercial kitchen. Um, we also have established an eight-week cycle menu that meets um, the new nutritional requirements that went into effect this year. Um, and we now have um, solid documentation. We have our menus, we have our standardized recipes, our production records um, that are all pre-filled so the person just has to fill out the day of service stuff. Um, and make any changes, and then our shopping lists. Um, so it's pretty, we've come a long way, I think, in the last, that's, this work has really been done over the last couple of years. Um, you know, we have lost a little bit of the student input into the menus, and that's the one piece of feedback that I hear from students, is that they would like to be able to choose their food more. Um, but it's sort of a trade-off between having to have a menu and having to um, be in compliance <laughs> and letting the kids choose their stuff choose their food. Um, oh, also the other thing is now we can bake for the whole food, or for the whole school. Before, with that small oven, we couldn't um, make a baked meal for everybody. And now you can see they're putting some fish in. Next slide, please. Um, we also um, have started offering a cooking class, a nutrition class, and gardening classes. Um, and those are still in development to a certain extent. Um, they are, the idea is for them to really be dovetailed with the menu so that you know, in the cooking class, the week that you um, learn what a dice is versus a mince versus a chop, you do the dicing and the mincing and the chopping for the meals you're making. You know, same thing with when you learn the benefits and nutrition class of green foods, that's the day we make sauteed kale or whatever. So we give students a chance to sort of experience what they are learning academically as well. Um, we also have started a couple of special programs. We did this fall, um, we did a mostly local lunch, and these pictures are pictures of students um, picking at a local U-Pick garden um, for our local lunch. And that was really exciting, because um, kids wanted to try it because they picked it. I was really impressed with it. Most of them didn't like what we made, but they still, um, they still tried it, which I think is great. Uh, we're also participating, the Sika Conservation Society has a Fish to Schools program. There's not a lot of farming in Southeast Alaska. It's not a great environment for growing food. Um, but there is a lot of fishing. And so the um, Conservation Society has set up a program where local fishermen donate fish. Um, and uh, we basically pay the processors to process it um, and get to serve it in our school. Um, and that's all the pictures you've been seeing of fish. Apparently, fish lunch days are the only days we take pictures. Um, and what it has taken a tremendous amount of of investment and support to get us here. Um, and so we're so appreciative of that. Um, we've gotten, we got some private funding to work on our cycle menus. Um, we had staff attend the Edible Schoolyard Academy last summer. We have some, um, some behavioral health grant money through our um, Alaska Alternative Schools Association. Um, the Fish to School program is a farm to school program. And then in the coming year, we're actually going to have a VISTA volunteer to help move our program forward. So, in addition, of course, to the ALC money that helped pay for the kitchen. One of the things about the ALC money, I think, um, is that it wasn't a lot of money. It didn't buy a lot, but it gave us a lot of bragging rights. It really got it, led us to be able to put into our VISTA volunteer application, you know, received one of five nationwide grants that from the Office of Minority Health. And that really stands out to people, I think, and it really, um, even if it's not a lot of money, the bragging rights, I think, really helped leverage that money into more money um, and more support. Next slide, please. So um, we've made some observations about this program over the years. Um, and that is, the big picture is really that we're meeting current hunger and nutrition needs. And we're developing skills in students so that they can meet their own future needs. And for me, this is, I'm really passionate about this because for me, this is really all about breaking the cycle of poverty. Um, I really feel like, and, and I've had the parents say to me, well, I never knew what was nutritious, so I didn't know how to teach my children. And so we are teaching young people what it is to be nutritious and to be healthy, and they are bringing that home to their families, and they are passing it on to their children. Um, we're in the process of making a little film. We didn't quite get it finished to show today, but we're in the process of making a little film that illustrates that really well with, um, with a particular student of ours who is both a parent and um, also a caregiver for her family. 
Um, so about 63% of our students um, eat lunch um, daily. And at least, uh, just in this past year, 58% took at least one food class and 16% took more than one. And that's just to this year. That doesn't take into account anyone who took one of the classes last year and took another one this year. Students are developing taste, a taste for nutritious food, and they're trying new things, which is super exciting. Um, and they're really learning what's nutritious and how to make their favorite foods more healthy and affordable. I think ranch dressing is this great example. It seems like our kids won't eat any salad or vegetables without ranch dressing which is about $5 a bottle at the store here, um, and tremendously bad for you. Uh, we have a great recipe um, for ranch that's based with Greek yogurt. And um, the kids make it, and they're like, what? That's it? That's all that goes into it? You know, it's basically ranch, or Greek yogurt and garlic and lime juice and salt and pepper, <laughs> you know, and parsley. And so the students see that and then read the ingredients on the bottle and compare the cost and are just blown away. Like, wow, that's so easy. I had no idea it was so easy. It tastes good, and it's so much better for me. So that's great. And we definitely get reports from, from their parents that they are cooking at home um, and also cooking for their children when they're parents. Um, the other thing that I'm seeing that I haven't tracked really well, I guess I should have known it would have happened, but I didn't really think about it, is that we're really seeing more and more students um, alumni employed in the food service industry. Students get their food workers card when they go through this program. And right now, I would say there are former Pacific High students working in at least half the restaurants in town, if not more. Um, and that, I thought, was pretty cool. I don't think it was like that before. I mean, food service has always been sort of an entry-level job industry, but, but kids, I think, um, are in the kitchen more and are cooking more, which is pretty, pretty good. There's also really increased enthusiasm for traditional foods. Um, fish and berries and things like that, um, and then also for gardening, which is sort of new. Um, you know, Sitka is in a little bit of a gardening renaissance, but getting our kids involved in that is great. You know, my, my grandparents grew up poor, and the way they survived was by hunting and gardening. And so if we can instill that in our students, they can also, I think, get out of poverty. Next slide, please. So we have an exciting future ahead of us, I think, for our Healthy Lunch, Healthy Lives program. Uh, we are getting a VISTA volunteer starting in August. Um, and for those of you who don't know, VISTA is an AmeriCorps program that is focused on program development, not direct service. And so um, we have this volunteer for up to three years to really develop this program. And we've been trying to get this program to a point where it could be replicated by other schools in Southeast Alaska or even other small schools throughout the nation. Um, and so the idea is to really do good documentation of the work. So we're going to revisit the menus and sort of make sure that they're really um, giving kids food they like. We're going to polish the documentation and we're going to address um, the financial sustainability of the program because we're not totally there yet. We've been a little bit subsidized all along. Um, create an implementa implementation guide and then also align our classes with our menus. We also, um, the Vista volunteer will also make a plan to expand it to summer lunch. So we'll adjust all our menus and stuff for younger children um, by partnering with the Sitka Tribe of Alaska. We can be an open site, and any young person in Alaska or in Sitka can come eat lunch during the summer. The goal with that is also to have a youth employment component, so where it's high school students actually cooking the food for other students. Um, and then we, <laughs> it's a plan to apply for a planning grant as well. We would like to do a farm to school program. That's maybe a little further off a longer term goal. Um, in the big picture, my vision is really that we would have a really authentic vocational culinary arts program that would have um, maybe some cafe components, but would also provide reimbursable meals for students um, during school and after school even. Um, you know, there's a lot of visiting teams. Sports are done weird here in Southeast Alaska where you have to sort of come for a whole weekend. So there's a lot of visiting teams who need to eat. That's a potential need. Or there's also small-scale catering. We already get asked to do small-scale catering. so. Um, and that's basically our program. Uh, so the next slide is just my um, contact information if you have any questions or if you're interested in staying updated on the program. Um, and there's more pictures of fish because that's what we take pictures of. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. And I know at Healthy Schools Campaign, we love learning about your program and have featured the Fish to School program on our blog and think that you're doing just wonderful and innovative work there. So thank you for your hard work. Thanks. And I am going to um, transition to our next speaker then, Grennan Sims, who was another ALC grantee. 
And Grennan is a registered dietitian and nutrition education coordinator for the Hickman Mills C1 School District in Kansas City, Missouri. Grennan has been with the district for 15 years, providing nutrition education in the classroom and cafeteria to students ages 3 through 18. She also develops and nutritionally analyzes school menus and manages food allergies in the school district. Grennan loves to cook with kids and empower them with knowledge and skills to make healthy food choices. So, Grennan, thank you so much for joining us today, and I will pass off the virtual gavel to you. All right, thanks, Alex. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share with you today about our Color My Tray program that was aimed at increasing fruit and vegetable consumption among kindergarten students at one of our elementary schools. Next slide, please. The Hickman Mills C1 School District is located in South Kansas City, Missouri. And although the district is in technically in a suburban area, if you look at our demographics here, that kind of portrays a, a, a different picture. A lot of the families from the inner city have been moving further south, and they're transplanting in our area. Fifteen years ago, less than 50% of our students qualified for free and reduced price meals. And today, as you can see, over 90% of the students at Ingalls Elementary participate in our subsidized meal program. Next slide, please. Now, due to the prevalence of low incomes in the Hickman Mills area, uh, car transportation is not always available. And this greatly limits access to fresh whole foods. There's actually only four grocery stores that carry fresh produce located in the 32 square mile district boundary. And the one store that's centrally located in our district is, in, is within one mile of actually only three schools. So walking to the grocery store is not really convenient either. So what ends up happening is that residents turn to the 20 fast food restaurants and 17 convenience stores that are located in our district boundaries. And of course, there's very few fresh fruits and vegetables that are available in these locations and lots of highly processed, low nutrient dense foods. Next slide, please. The limited financial resources and the limited reliable transportation really just create access barriers to healthy whole foods. Many of our families in the Heckman Mill School District face food insecurity and hunger. Uh, poor quality diets and activity patterns lead to a very high incidence of negative health consequences like obesity and heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and so forth. Approximately 40% of our student population is actually considered to be overweight or obese, but they're malnourished. Next slide, please. A natural extension of building a healthy school environment, of course, includes fostering a healthy home environment as well. And the most effective programs designed to form healthy eating habits in young children combine nutrition education with the opportunity to taste a variety of healthy foods. And then it's also important that children have the opportunity to take home the knowledge and skills that they learn in the classroom so that they can positively influence the foods that are purchased and consumed in the home. Next slide, please. Our wellness program vision in the Hickman Mills District that you can see here is actually comprised of three main elements. One being focusing on the total school environment, uh, outreach to district families in the home, and the integration of a multifaceted program. The Color My Tray program that was funded through the Action Learning Collaborative really embodies this vision at Ingalls Elementary. Next slide. All of the elementary schools in the Heckman Mills C1 School District participate in the USDA Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program. And what that means is that we actually provide fresh fruit and vegetable snacks in every classroom in all eight of our elementary schools twice a week. The Color My Tray program goal was to increase kindergarten student consumption and knowledge of fruits and vegetables by using a variety of different elements to enhance that existing FFB program. Uh, we assessed produce consumption by measuring pre and post service weights of fruits and vegetables using a digital scale that was purchased through the Action Learning Collaborative Award. I apologize, I don't have a picture of the scale here. Apparently that was an oversight on my part. I'm going to have to go out and get one of those. But um, 
we decided to go with a digital scale because those of you that might work in um, food service know that the little dial scales are not very accurate and we wanted to have some accurate um, data to collect. And then we also evaluated our program effectiveness through a pre and post knowledge assessment. Next slide, please. We wanted to take a look at student perception or kindergarten student perception of what their lunch tray looks like. So we gave them actually an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper that looks like this, and we asked the kindergarten students to color a picture of what their school lunch tray looks like. Next slide. Pre-programmed lunch trays looked a lot like this. Uh, with very little color. I'm thinking that's some chicken nuggets there on the right-hand side, maybe some corn, and then it looks like there's something kind of greenish up there in the left-hand corner. Next slide. Post-program lunch trays, though, were very, very colorful. Can we have the next slide, please? Literally, students were coloring their tray with more fruits and vegetables. Now, assessing nutrition knowledge of kindergartners in an objective format is certainly a challenge at best. We attempted to use the assessment tool that you see here um, to take a pre and post test evaluation of what they knew about nutrition. Um, and what we found was that it, you know they were supposed to draw a line from like the fruits to the band-aid because um, fruits help heal your cuts and bruises. And what we found were that kids just drew lines haphazardly, whether it was the pre or the post test. We probably would have been better served by just asking them their nutrition knowledge and then writing down the results. So this wasn't a good uh, tool, but you know you have to try it before you know if it works. Uh, next slide, please. So part of the program was that every kindergartner received a tasting passport to be stamped each time that they tried a fresh fruit and vegetable in the classroom. The stamps said, I tried it, and there was a space for them to write the date, just like in a real passport. We encouraged the teachers to take the time to actually educate the students about why we have passports, that you need them to travel to other countries. And on the inside cover of the passport, um, our school nutrition staff had a little note that actually said, or actually invited the students to take a journey to healthy learning. Um, the front and the back covers were color or were printed in color, but the inside, as you can see, was black and white, and we encouraged the kids to color the pictures of the fruits and vegetables because that's what kindergartners are doing. You know, they're practicing their coloring skills and staying in the lines, and um, so it was a fun thing for them to do. And then at the end of the 12 weeks, students were encouraged to count up how many stamps that they got in their passport, and that would represent how many fruits and vegetables that they tried during the course of the program. And we used some of our money from the grant to help print these passports and to get them folded and that sort of thing. Next slide, please. Uh, students also received Harvest of the Week family newsletters twice weekly, highlighting the fruit and vegetables received as a classroom snack during that week. Each newsletter includes serving suggestions on how to help get your child to eat healthy and to consume the produce at home. The Harvest of the Week newsletters also provide specific produce cleaning and storage tips because a lot of our parents, you know, they're not buying produce at home, so they have no idea how to clean them, how to cut them, how to prepare them, how you should store them or anything. So we thought that was important to include in our Harvest of the Week newsletter. And then we included a healthy recipe, nutrition facts about uh, the fruit or vegetable, information that correlated health and learning. Uh, we encouraged physical activity, and then we always put some sort of fun fact about the fruit or vegetable. We printed these newsletters in color so that it would grab the adult reader's attention as they're pulling their papers out of their kindergartner's backpack. So we didn't want these to get lost in the mix with everything else. And again, thanks to the grant, we were able to defer some of our costs of color printing. Um, the goal of the Harvest of the Week was to enable us to connect what was happening in the classroom with what was happening at home. Next slide, please. Color My Tray element number three requested applications from our fifth grade students to be fruit and vegetable ambassadors. 
one ambassador from each classroom took turns reading morning announcements that I prepared and put together for them. Um, but they would read the announcements to introduce whatever the featured produce was for the week. And the idea was to generate excitement and so some, some, something that the kids would get excited about. And what I had to do, though, was to go and find a fun, interesting fact about all the produce that we were offering. And I have to tell you, there's not a lot of interesting facts about celery. But we found a really great one, and I thought I would read the morning announcement about celery. It says, did you know that Mr. Celery runs out onto the field at Wilmington Blue Rocks minor league baseball games every time they score a run? It's true. They're the only baseball team to have celery as one of their mascots. So add some crunch to your day by tasting celery as a classroom snack. It's a vegetable and the mascot. So anyway, uh, I had no idea that any baseball team had celery as their mascot, and I thought that was pretty cool. So we tried to throw in some fun facts that kids would like about that. Um, you know, we talked about broccoli being broccoli trees and that you could um, put snow on them if you wanted to use the little um, PC that we provided a fat-free ranch dressing. Um, we told kids about what the name was of the little strings that form when you peel a banana. They actually have a name. I didn't know that. It's called phloem. And we told kids that if you peel your banana upside down, like from the bottom up, that you'll get less phloem. And just some other fun facts. And we included, of course, information about whether it's a fruit or a vegetable. And then not every time, but we would put in, obviously, some nutrition information about, you know, that, this, that oranges have vitamin C, and vitamin C helps heal your cuts and bruises, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, the kids had a blast, our ambassadors had a blast uh, reading those announcements, and it was a way to get the, the students involved in the process. Next slide, please. With the Action Learning Collaborative Award, we purchased a flat screen TV and mounted it in the serving area at Ingalls Elementary for students to view as they waited in line. Each week we featured a new fruit and vegetable, and we also included various nutrition wellness messages like, you know, wash your hands, wash your, your produce before you eat it, things like that. These slides shows were updated each month to include our school lunch and breakfast menus as well. And the PowerPoint slide that played, played on a continuous loop throughout the day, not just at mealtime. So as the students passed through the hallway, they could also see our nutrition and health messages. Next slide. The fifth element and probably the most effective component of the Color My Tray program were the chef visits. And I have some pictures of those here in a little bit. Each month, a local chef visited the cafeteria to share a new recipe featuring one of the produce offerings that the students enjoyed in their classrooms that week. So if they had zucchini in the classroom, a fresh zucchini slices that week in the classroom, then that week we did a cooked zucchini recipe at lunch. And I'll have to tell you that the stuff were so great with the kids. I mean, this kids would literally squeal with delight when the chefs walked in. Um, one of them, one of our chefs actually has uh, kindergarten triplets, and he showed the, the kindergarten students a picture of his girls. And every time he came in, they wanted to see the picture. You know, and the, the chefs would give them a high five, and they just really made a connection with these kids. And because of that connection, then the students would just listen to everything that they had to say. And that was a really wonderful thing that happened out of that partnership. Now, the students would receive stickers for trying whatever the recipe was over the day, and this was a huge success. We could get reluctant taste testers um, coaxed into trying the new food if we promised them to have a sticker, which you see some of the ones here. Next slide, please. We offered zucchini parmesan at the very first chef tasting visit, and the kids thought it smelled and tasted like pizza, so they gobbled it up and they wanted more. Our chefs told the students that zucchini is a vegetable, it grows on the vine, vegetables help you see in the dark, stuff like the world's largest zucchini, seven foot long, stuff like that. They just had a lot of fun with it. Next slide. The day that we did the ginger glaze snap peas and carrots, we invited our superintendent over to actually taste test with the kids. And the director of media relations came over and took pictures. And it was a great, good time. But what was interesting was that the director of media relations made this comment. He said, I never thought I would see kids get so excited about eating peas and carrots ever. And it was true. The kids just gobbled it up. And those stickers, I'm telling you, those were like the best thing 
ever. Because if a chef saw that a kid hadn't you know, tasted their peas and carrots, he would say, you know, if you taste it, I'll give you a sticker. And usually once they tried it, then they really, they really liked it. So stickers are magical, I have to say. Uh, next slide, please. Our students were always super duper proud to share their empty sample cups to show us that they had actually uh, tasted what we provided. And as you can see here, they love the apple salad with candied walnuts. Next slide, please. Our students um, have always enjoyed fresh broccoli dipped in fat-free ranch dressing. And typically, they'll eat Coke broccoli with cheese sauce, too. But we were shocked and amazed that they literally were drinking up the broccoli cheese soup. If you see the little girl on the bottom left, she's got like a little mustache, kind of like a milk mustache. But it was a soup mustache because she was drinking it up. But they were eating it, too. Um, I didn't provide you with all the pictures that I have because I have probably like a 1,000 of them. But our kids also had sweet potatoes with rosemary infused sugar. We didn't have to put marshmallows on the top, and they still ate the sweet potatoes. We had uh, strawberry mango salsa, stuff like that. They just loved it. Uh, next slide, please. Overall, we were really very pleased with our program outcomes. We had two goals, uh, to increase fruit and vegetable consumption in our fresh fruit and vegetable program by 15% and also to increase produce consumption at lunch by 15%. And you know, there were certainly some obstacles of data collection to overcome, but we can, I feel pretty comfortable saying that there was a 15% increase in vegetable intake as a direct result of the Color My Tray program by our kindergartners. Now, fruit consumption, there really wasn't any big change because our kids have always been really good uh, fruit eaters, so there wasn't a change there. And then at the mealtimes, we thought we would be able to uh, objectively assess just the kindergartner's consumption, and that proved to be a challenge. Uh, so what we looked at instead was just our overall uh, produce purchases. And we did find that the school was buying more fruits and vegetables than ever before. And our uh, child nutrition managers reported that the kids were eating stuff like sliced cucumbers and red pepper slices that they hadn't eaten before, but they were doing it this year. So I think they were definitely eating more fruits and vegetables. And the last slide, um, I just wanted to say thanks to the Healthy School Environments Action Learning Collaborative Award. I think the Color My Tray program was a big success. We were able to enhance an existing program, the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, to increase uh, fruit and vegetable consumption. The Color My Tray program is easily sustainable based on our initial purchases made through the grant, as well as our networking connections formed through our partnership with the chefs. We look forward to continuing the program at Ingalls and actually expanding it into our other schools. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Grennan. Um, that's a really wonderful program, and it was great to hear you share more information about it. And the pictures are fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so we, I know we are a few minutes over. We do have some questions. So if people are able to stay on, um, we will take a few minutes to answer some questions. If people have to leave, I understand. Um, just a few questions that have come in. Um, one that came in multiple times, actually, for Grennan and Sarah, is if both of you could speak about what a, some of the barriers were to implementing your programs and how you address those barriers. So maybe, Sarah, could you speak to that question first, and then Grennan? Um, yeah, I think the, you know, we, we had, politically, we always had lots and lots of support. We never had to, um, we never had to fight politically to, to implement this program. Um, you know, really, the, um, the barrier, I think two barriers, the, the biggest one actually has been sort of the, um, the time investment and the, the paperwork. Um, and that's really the goal of our whole replication project is to eliminate that for anyone else who wants to do something similar. That you, you all are probably aware that the um, documentation required for the Federal School Lunch Program is incredibly um, daunting. And, uh, and in fact, I actually, my observation from this is this is why we serve packaged foods, because they come with the documentation. Um, and the system is not set up to be friendly to people who cook from scratch. It's really, I mean, the child nutrition database is full of prepared foods, and a lot of the vegetables that I used just weren't in there. So, um, so that was interesting and challenging, and we have, in a lot of ways, done some workarounds to address that. But that's sort of the whole goal of, of implementing the, um, 
the cycle menu and creating all the documentation and so that if other schools wanted to try this out, they wouldn't have to reinvent that wheel. Um, so I think we, we've had a lot of support from our state um, Child Nutrition Services Department. They've been incredibly supportive um, in, in helping us with that. Um, I think the other barrier that we haven't fully addressed has been a financial barrier. This program is subsidized. Um, ultimately, in the district as a whole, we bring in more from, um, from reimbursement than we spend on our lunch contract. And so the district has been willing to subsidize our program probably by about 20% um, over the years. And so that's another huge goal for the VISTA volunteer is to, um, is to address that. And I think part of that for us is just that we purchase retail. Um, at this point because we have a pretty small economy of scale and so if you're going to serve different vegetables every week you, you really can't buy a case of vegetables. You might buy five pounds of broccoli but you don't buy 30 pounds of broccoli. So, um, so that's something that we're looking at addressing through the VISTA program. Great. Thank you much, so much, Sarah. And Grennan, do you have any thoughts on barriers that you encountered with your program? Well, with the program implementation, we were wanting to assess our outcomes. So our, our biggest barrier really was how we had to collect the, uh, the waste, the residual waste after the kids had eaten the produce. That was a hassle. But if someone's implementing the program, then they're not going to probably be doing that study. Um, they might. I don't know. But collecting uh, what was left from the orange peels after the end of the day so that they didn't throw it away. Um, that was uh, definitely a barrier. But as far as implementing the program itself, um, really it was just gaining that teacher buy-in so that they don't see it as being something extra that's being put upon them. Fortunately, we were enhancing the existing USDA fresh fruit and vegetable program that had been in place for three years already, so teachers were used to doing it. It wasn't new. The only thing that was new was the tasting passport. That we handed, uh, that we asked them to stamp as the uh, kids got their, their their produce samples, and then sending home the newsletters. So we just had to really coach them about how this is going to help enhance the students' consumption and get them excited about wanting to eat their fruits and vegetables. We had one teacher who didn't want to do it, and that happens. But the other two, I think, over time convinced her it wasn't really that big of a deal and it didn't take that much time out of her day, but getting the, the teacher buy-in is, is really, really important. Great. Thank you so much, Gwen. And I think that's, um, you brought up some really important issues, and um, I think you guys did a great job thinking it through. And then we have uh, a question for Sarah, and Gwen, feel free to jump in as well. Um, one of our, our audience participants uh, talked about, you know, how you lost a lot of time when students went home, you know, when you had open campus and you lost a lot of valuable time. Can you speak to how you've been able to recoup that valuable time since the implementation of your program? And what kind of positive things have you noticed or even from teachers to students that happen during the lunch hour? Um, it, it was really a tremendous difference when we started making our own lunch at school. Um, it's interesting. I've been teaching half time for about 10 years now um, and job sharing, and that's the co-principal stuff. And I had the afternoon shift, um, and I, which is after lunch, of course. And I remember the year that we implemented the school lunch program, um, and I would arrive during lunchtime usually, and, and I just remember saying, wow, you know, I just haven't done anywhere near as many, um, I think we call them problem-solving contracts back then, and that's our discipline method. I was like, the kids have just been great, you know, it's just, I don't know what it is. And then my husband, Phil, who worked in the morning, he would say, I don't know what you're talking about. It's the same as it has always been. And so I sort of, as a teacher, anecdotally noticed that children's behavior was really improved because they were eating not only lunch, but nutritious lunch, delicious lunch, you know. Um, participation went from, you know, under 10 percent to 50 or above pretty much immediately and and we had you know during the lunch hour we had students we don't have a lunch room so we had students in classrooms with teachers eating lunch teachers would sit down with students and eat lunch and you know and that's that informal time to get to know students um, that had really been lost um, when we changed buildings and came over here and didn't have a quality lunch program at all I don't know if that really answers the question but um, but we're definitely noticing 
you know, students also spending time with each other, I think, helps them build their community as well. So that informal time where staff can overhear what students are talking about, you know, so they get to know them better and, and ask them questions and, you know, just be another positive adult influence in their lives. Great. Thank you, Sarah. I think that's an excellent answer to that question. Um, and then, LaJoy, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Oh, fantastic. Um, so a question for you. Um, we were wondering, we had a couple questions come in about um, what the Office of Minority Health is working on in the future. I know the Action Learning Collaborative was a really exciting project and um, gave, had the opportunity to fund some of these types of projects. Does the Office of Minority Health Resource Center have any future initiatives you guys are working on along similar lines? Well, of course, right now, the agency is working diligently with uh, other agencies within HHS to uh, ensure that the community is well-versed in various aspects of the Affordable Care Act with the health exchanges coming up in the fall and has released something called the class enhanced class standards, which speak to cultural and linguistic standards around health care. In terms of our uh, many awards with the community, um, the, uh, the awards that we, were, we provided uh, back in 2011 were specifically tied to Minority Health Month, the theme of Minority Health Month that particular year. And this, this year, we did not give awards, but we have the focus primarily was on the Affordable Care Act, and that's what the agency is really uh, focused on right now. We have uh, worked with, in different capacities, other community-based organizations in other parts of, well, not only the country, but the in U.S. territories to enhance their efforts around uh, health communications and health campaigns, uh, but that mostly has a focus on um, HIV, TB, perhaps diabetes, and other things of that nature. So right now, uh, that's what we're working on. Uh, it, the, the projects that came out of this are so incredibly exciting, and we're very happy that everything turned out uh, well. But uh, the Minority Health Month theme changes from year to year, and there are years that we do have awards and years that we don't. So just stay tuned, uh, sign up for our newsletters, and um, you'll uh, be uh, uh, on tap if there's something new that comes out in terms of funding. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, LaJoy. And I, I think that's a great note to wrap up on, seeing as we are almost 15 minutes over. So thank you, everybody, who was able to stick around. Thank you once again to our presenters for sharing the wonderful work uh, that you are all leading. And we really appreciate you taking the time to share it with us today. Um, so we hope everybody enjoys the rest of your day. And thanks again for joining us. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you.